Uh, my talk is about adaptive networks, yeah? so uh, adaptive dynamical networks. Uh, you have seen several talks on uh, neural networks with plasticity, the previous talk of Sarah, the talk of Peter Tass, and uh, you have seen how important it is that a neural network changes connections with time, so it's plastic somehow after the injury or, uh, or when we learn something, uh, our brain uh, makes new connections and learn some stuff. So this talk is about uh, how we can model it mathematically and what classes of adaptive networks we, we can have and what kind of basic phenomena we can expect in these systems. So let me uh, start with uh, an introduction. Uh, so this is first, uh, these are just dynamical networks. Uh, you see, it, uh, for in dynamical networks, we have nodes, which has certain dynamics. Here you can see xj dot this is, uh, equals to f xj of t describes the dynamics of one node. In this case, it's time continuous dynamics, or it can be time descript dynamics. I have written here uh, in a non-autonomous uh, form, so we can have also external time. And if we are speaking about dynamical networks, uh, we assume that there is an interaction term additionally. Okay, this, uh, so we have internal dynamics and uh, additionally we have coupling term which describes the interaction between the nodes. In this particular case, I wrote just uh, interaction coupling matrix kappa ij or adjacency matrix and interaction coupling function g i j uh, which is here, uh, describes the pairwise interaction in this case. Or you can have a dynamical network in discrete time, which you correspondingly have as a discrete dynamical system. And by the way, you can ask questions also during the talk if something is not clear. So uh, very often we have autonomous case, uh, as we have seen also during uh, several talks in this conference, uh, when we don't have uh, explicitly time in, in the equations. So usually in dynamical networks, uh, we have fixed coupling weights kappa ij. So we have fixed topology, and on this topology we have a dynamics, and we are looking for what kind of dynamic synchronization or desynchronization takes place. Now the next step in the modeling would be to have a dynamical system on temporally evolving networks. So if, we, if uh, the dynamics of the network changes with time, and in part, for example, here in time continuous case, we could have uh, coupling weights, which depends on time. They can have some, for certain time, zero level, so that means we don't have connection, or not zero level, we have connection. And that would be kind of dynamical system on temporally evolving networks with changing structure in time continuous case and time discrete case. So this is a kind of skew uh, system. Uh, when a coupling uh, topology kappa influences the, the dynamics of the system. So now I would like to speak about the next level, uh, about adaptive networks when we have uh, both the, the coupling topology changing the state of the system and also the state of the system changes uh, coupling topology. So we don't no longer have a skew uh, symmetric case, but we have uh, we have interaction between the topology and dynamics. For example, if we have pairwise interaction, uh, this dynamical system can be written like this. So this is a, like standard dynamical networks with a coupling topology described by the adjacency matrix kappa. But then if you additionally assume that coupling uh, topology, coupling coefficients, they are dynamical variables, so they change in time, for example, like this, then we have now uh, adaptive dynamical network. And in this case, uh, for example, if we have this kind of adaptation, that would mean that we have pairwise adaptation. So the coupling weight between the node i and node j is dynamic, dynamical, and it depends on the states of the node i and the node j. So this is the case. In, for example, for STDP, yeah, spike time independent plasticity, which I will uh, mention also later a little bit. But of course, we could have more general adaptation rules 
where we have a dynamical network and dyna adaptation of the coupling ways can be more complicated or just different. They are not necessarily pairwise interactions. And you can write it in very general form. Uh, I uh, copied here a picture from, from this uh, review paper of uh, Tilo Gross and Bert Plasius. They uh, illustrating uh, the same idea, the coupling between the topology and the dynamics. So if we have uh, dynamics of the system, uh, it describes the state of each node, and the states of each node, they influence the topology. So the states of each node can uh, make some connection disappear or appear. And uh, vice versa, also the connectivity influences the local dynamics. So this is the main property of uh, adaptive dynamical networks, so that Sometimes they are called co-evolutionary, so that we have not only dynamical states changing their, their, uh, their uh, values, but also the connectivity. So, uh, maybe one more remark regarding the general introduction about dy uh, adaptive dynamical networks, that the weights can change continuously, like here, but also we, very often in applications, we have a discontinuous change, so that at, uh, updates of the coupling weights, they can change uh, discontinuously in certain moments of time, like, for instance, neuron spikes. And here's just a, some example, like the change of coupling weights ij uh, equals to some function of the state of, of the system. So that's the, uh, very often in application also. Okay. Uh, from the point of view of modeling, the phase oscillators are also uh, plays important role. They're quite useful, and I will show you later, in the modeling of the dynamics of adaptive networks. And this is an example. So if we have pairwise interactions, we can still consider uh, coupling, coupled phase oscillators, phi i dot, like here, with certain adaptation. Uh, more simple class, if we consider weakly coupled phase oscillators, as we have seen in this conference also, we can reduce uh, by the averaging the interaction to the phase differences. And then we have this particular case. Um, it's interesting to consider also uh, the case when the adaptation of the coupling weights, kappa, uh, takes place on a, another time scale. So usually, like in neural system, the spike, uh, sp spiking of the neurons they occur on the fast time scale, but the change of the neural dynamics they, takes place slower. That's why it's useful in the modeling to have this epsilon small parameter, which emphasizes this slow character of the update. Okay, and finally, the, the most uh, probably simple, but still very complicated model for adaptive network could be this uh, one of kind of generalization of a core motor system. A phase oscillator system with adaptations uh, of coupling weights, kappa ij. Uh, so you see that, uh, so just taking sinus for, for the coupling and sinus for the adaptation. Uh, this system looks simple, but it is very high dimensional. In comparison to Kuramoto system, let's say a Kuramoto system is n dimensional, we have n nodes. This system is n square plus n dimensional. So if the, dimension is huge, so it, it's, it's very complicated. So we would like to understand the dynamics of these systems. Uh, a few examples, uh, we have seen them, them already during this conference, but shortly to remind you, uh, when such systems appear. Uh, the first very important example is a neural plasticity, and in particular spike timing dependent plasticity, STDP. Uh, if we have two neurons, uh, A, I, and J, which are coupled directionally, so usually we have a directional connection in case of synaptic uh, connections. Uh, they can be described by uh, coupling weight kappa ij, and uh, if the neuron spike, like presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron, then uh, we look at the spike timing distance between the spike, delta t ij, and at each spike moment, uh, the coupling weight between the two neurons updates accordingly to this rule. So it updates like a very small increment, epsilon, multiplied by the update function, which is uh, given here. It's a kind of experimentally measured function. And one can see that if uh, the delta t is positive, which means that the 
neuron J spikes first and then neuron I spikes. So it's kind of causal uh, case. Then the coupling weight increases uh, according to this function. But if we have another, another case that neuron I spikes and then neuron J, then uh, the coupling weights are decreased. And so this is a classical and very important uh, dynamical adaptive network. And we can just very formally, mathematically write it in this form. Yeah? So we have a neural model plus the interaction function. In this case, they are pairwise interactions. And uh, the update takes place discontinuously. So I uh, denoted by delta kappa. So it's just a discontinuous change of kappa ij. Takes place at the moments uh, I denoted here formally u i u j. So this is the moments where neuron i or neuron j fires and spikes. So at this moment, the update is equal to, to this update function. And you see that this is uh, like, uh, this form of dynamical adaptive network. And there are many other examples, yes? So they, they, that's why it's they're very important. So if we look at this class of systems, uh, then uh, of course we have a lot of different phenomena, uh, starting of course from synchronization. And uh, also the synchronization in such systems has its own features. We have explosive synchronization, and uh, it's, it's like an open question how synchronization takes place in different classes of adaptive networks. But also, uh, we can have frequency cluster, solitary states, uh, recurrent synchronization, self-organized noise resistance. So one can show that such systems may possess uh, self-organizing uh, noise resistance. So if you put noise to the system, it adapts its, its connection in such a way that uh, it con contracts the noise effects. Um, Explosive synchronization I mentioned, uh, you can have chimera states and self-organized criticality. This is also an important feature of such systems. So let me just uh, here give you two examples of these systems. I just, uh, in the following, give you an example of frequency clusters, how we, they emerge and what, what they are in, in these uh, models, and recurrent synchronization. Uh, I think they are quite representative, and they are indeed appearing because of the interaction of structure and the dynamics of individual nodes. So the first part, in the following, that will be two parts, uh, presentation. First, I would like to show how the recurrent synchronization appear uh, in adaptive dynamical networks. And I will also show that, uh, or mention rather, that Asymmetric adaptivity leads to such recurrent synchronization. OK, so uh, this slide shows the main idea. So for many of you, if you just see this slide, you understand immediately what it is about. The main idea is the following. So uh, because we have the system with slow adaptation, so a slow variable, then uh, the network passes through different states recurrently. First, the network becomes synchronized. But then because we have the slow changes of the coupling uh, weights, it goes through this region and then becomes desynchronized. And this takes place recurrently, so that you, you can have periodic changes between synchronization and desynchronization. And what I'm going to show you is an illustration for two popul populations of Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, or two Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. And also, I show you the minimal model of two interacting phase oscillators with plasticity. So I think that such minimal models are very important to understand the, the physics, the, the main idea of the phenomena. And the, the first example shows that it's model independent somehow. And this is a joint result with Max Thiele, Rico Berno, Peter Tass, and Eckhart Scholl. So let me start with uh, a, a little bit uh, more illustrating the main idea. Uh, in fact, we will have two slow variables in our system, which will be just two uh, coupling weights. And uh, because they are slow, then for, we can consider for a short time them as a constant. And if we look for these uh, two parameters corresponding to two slow variables, then our system can have two uh, states, asynchronous and synchronous. And then the slow motion of our system will correspond to a periodic solution 
which uh, goes in the synchronous regime and the synchronous regime. So this is the main idea here I would like to show and illustrate in our models. So this is uh, now, uh, again, phenomenological mean field representation. So we have just one system, one neuron, one oscillator, or you can have one population uh, of uh, neurons which uh, is described by a certain mean field variable x1. Another population is described by a certain uh, state variable x2. Uh, additionally, what we have in adaptive networks, we have also coupling weights, kappa 1 and kappa 2, which are changing in time. So they are not fixed, uh, they are changing in time accordingly to certain adaptation rule. So very general, this setup can be written just as a, this uh, general system of four ODEs. So we have a system for the dynamics of the first, first population, dynamics of the second population, the coupling weights for kappa 1 and coupling weight kappa 2. And I only assume that uh, they are that small, yeah, that uh, slow, yeah, that uh, the dynamics of uh, coupling weights is slow, proportional to epsilon. And uh, so what we can do in this system, first we assume, as I mentioned, that the fast system, so the dynamics of two uh, population for fixed coupling weights, so we fix kappa 1, kappa 2, in this region, yeah, this is now kappa 1 and this is kappa 2, in this region has uh, synchrony, oh no, here is desynchronized. In this region we assume that the, fast, the same fast system is synchronous. Yeah, that's possible because we have parameters kappa 1, kappa 2, and this is a kind of generic case. Now the second, what we need is the following. We uh, take the whole system and average uh, with respect to, to fast variables. So somehow we average with respect to x1, x2, and we also average the, the right-hand side of, uh, of the slow changing coupling weights, kappa 1, kappa 2. This is the right-hand side, which is averaged with respect to the time scale of the fast system. So the slow system is still kind of uh, not changing strongly. And we just have average system, which is uh, two-dimensional to the ODE with respect to kappa 1, kappa 2. And this is exactly that system, what I mean. So in the dynamics in this uh, plane is described by this average system. And what we just need is to have that the system has a periodic uh, solution which moves into the synchronization region and uh, desynchronization region. So let me illustrate now with uh, two examples, or even three. Uh, and start with the minimal model, because it gives you kind of understanding what happens. So we have uh, two phase oscillators, phi 1, phi 2, kind of Kuramoto type. You can have also alpha phase shift parameter. Uh, the coupling weight kappa 1 changes according to this equation, kappa 2 uh, changes according to this equation. And uh, so what I will do now is uh, I will average with respect to the fast variables, phi 1, phi 2, and I will get the system a two-dimensional system for kappa 1, kappa 2 as an average system. It will look like this. Um, here I don't have epsilon because I moved to, to, I rescaled time by this epsilon, so I just eliminated this epsilon. And this rescaled time now uh, described by prime. Yeah? So this is a fast time scale with dot. This is a slow time scale with prime. Okay, and uh, so this w1 hat is just average of this function and w2 hat is average of that function uh, with respect to the fast dynamics phi1, phi2. And so and next slide is uh, a little bit technical, but the idea is very simple. I just show how, how I do this averaging. Yeah, so that's, that's the main point of the next slide. Uh, okay, so we have this system and uh, first I introduce the phase difference. Uh, Theta is phi 1 minus phi 2, for the frequencies is omega 1 minus uh, omega 2. And because of the symmetry of the system, uh, 
the, the, the first fast two variables can be written with respect to this phase difference variable as one equation. So just theta dot equals to, to this, depending only on theta. So it depends only on the phase difference. Uh, and uh, adaptation variables remain here like, like before. Yes? Assume that the frequencies will be constant. The frequencies, yes, are assumed to be constant. The average, if they are not constant, is about three. Yeah, right. That would be more complicated if they will change in time. Uh, the idea still remains. You can do the averaging, but not so simple. Yes? OK, and now what we want to do, we want to average over these fast oscillations, or fast dynamics. And this averaging can be done uh, simple. And there are two cases which appear here. The first case is when we have a fixed point of the fast dynamics. Yeah? If the fast dynamics has a stable equilibrium, it just converges to the stable equilibrium. Yeah? And that's in, in the fast slow system analysis, it's called critical manifold. Yeah? So we just look for the, uh, this equilibria. We put the right hand side to zero. Uh, so this right-hand side, due to, uh, by trigonometric manipulations, can be written like this. And we can just exp explicitly solve with respect to theta. Uh, OK, uh, we can solve with respect to theta, but not always. Yeah? It's on only in the case if omega is smaller than a. Yeah? Then this equation has a fixed point. And do we solve? And then we have theta uh, with index at, so a kind of adiabatic elimination. Uh, it's physically, it is an adiabatic elimination. So we find this stable fixed point, and uh, what we need, we just substitute it here in the, into the slow equation. So here for theta, we substitute the stable fixed point of the fast dynamics. And then we just have an explicit, uh, very nice two-dimensional dynamical system which we can analyze. Uh, but there is also another case when omega uh, larger than a, then we see that this uh, equation doesn't have fixed point. Uh, and this is the case when the two phase oscillators do not synchronize. Yeah? So the phase difference rotates. They have different frequencies. In this case, we don't have this critical manifold. We have periodic rotation. And uh, one can do it explicitly. I don't, don't do it here, but can average over the period of these oscillations. And this is what we have at the end of, of, of the system. Uh, so the system is also very simple. It depends on some constant C1, C2. But these constants are just functions of uh, coupling weights. So it's just nothing as, as else like a right-hand side, depending on kappa 1 and kappa 2. And we have just uh, a system in, on the plane which has, in one case, this form, in another case, this form, uh, depending whether we are in, in region of synchronization or desynchronization. So we have the main idea, we have explicit equation, which is we can analyze completely and find this periodic solution. And this is our bifurcation analysis with respect to two parameters, A and B. So I remind you, A and B are where they are here, the uh, adaptation parameter, A and B. And with respect to these parameters, we found in the plane space, uh, so again, 2D systems are simple to analyze, bifurcation also, many things analytically. So we find these orange regions uh, where which correspond to recurrent synchronization. And in particular, the, this orange, re, orange region is also split into two parts, A and B. In part A, we have this uh, phase plane of this 2D system. In the part B, this phase plane. And uh, what we have here, let me explain you. Uh, we have here this uh, red part correspond to synchronization. And this green, green part correspond to desynchronization, asynchrony. And the green uh, line correspond to a stable limit cycle. So the system indeed has this stable limit cycle, which goes a little bit in the synchronous region, then desynchronous region, etc. And this is how the order parameter of this system uh, behaves with time. Uh, this is a stable dynamic. So the order parameter oscillates, and then it's one oscillates, and then it's close to zero because we have anti-phase kind of phase locking, then again, etc. In In the region B, it's interesting, we have uh, the coexistence of such recurrent synchronization 
a green limit cycle, and a stable uh, fixed point here inside. And the boundary between two regions is this blue cycle, unstable. Uh, and that means if we start here, so if we start with coupling weights which are sufficiently large outside of this uh, blue uh, circle, uh, if we start here, we are converging to a limit cycle, green limit cycle, and we have recurrent synchronization in the system. But if our initial uh, coupling weights are not so strong, we are inside this uh, domain, we are converging to the fixed point, and our system kind of dynamically decouples. Yeah? So they are uncoupled, and they, they are, of course, asynchronous. And, Okay, so we see the same. So, so this limit cycle is attracting from outside and repelling from inside? No, this, this, uh, this green limit cycle is attracting from both sides, from here and ah, from sorry, here. I'm sorry, I misread it. Yeah, but the basin of attraction of this green cycle is, uh, lives outside of this blue okay. one. So it's, okay, so there are two limit cycles. Yeah, the, the, this, this one is asymptotically stable limit cycle, but this one is unstable. This one makes... Uh, a boundary between uh, basins of attraction of two, two regimes. In terms of the equations from previous slides, what's the difference between case one and case two? Yeah, so this, uh, this was case one and this was case I two. I know, but in, in terms of the equations, if you go back to the previous slides. Oh, sorry, it was the wrong, wrong direction, sorry. Yeah, so um, in, in, the, in this case, oh, yeah. we see, have this I equation. See, I see, I see, the square root. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, for specialists, uh, that the dynamics, it consists of two different parts. Yeah, We have one right-hand side here, another right-hand side here. It's interesting that the right-hand side is continuous, despite of the fact that here we have just fixed point, here we have averaging over the periodic solution. Uh, but it's not uh, differentiable at this point. So that's why we have such solutions which are kind of we see a little bit some, something happens on the boundary. But it's not so bad because it's still, the right hand side is still continuous. Okay, so uh, the next slide is a little bit, just to confuse you a little bit, but just to show that uh, this is a particular case which we are interested in, uh, in recurrent synchronization. But if you look in this system, more details, look for more bifurcation, you can even find more, more phenomena, which, which are also interesting in this system. And this is what I want to, to, to tell you. By this slide, you don't have to go into details here. There are different regions uh, with respect to parameters A and B, and recurrent synchronization was here when we had the limit cycle going in synchron synchronous and desynchronous regime. But there are also different other options in the system depending on the parameter. Uh, for example, here we have a limit cycle which, uh, which leaves completely in the synchronous regime. So it's just always synchronous, but periodically changing phase uh, difference. Or we can have like limit cycles which leaves inside in the desynchronized regime. So it's really very rich dynamics here. But of course, from our point of view, this uh, recurrent synchronization is the most interesting because we we move back and forth to become synchronous and desynchronous with time. So uh, just uh, uh, very shortly to mention that uh, we found out that such recurrent synchronization appears when the adaptation rule for, from one neuron to another neuron uh, differ, differ from the adaptation rule in, in a different direction. So we, can ha uh, kind of have an um, asymmetric adaptation rule. And uh, here I just supported by, by bifurcation diagram. We have a symmetry on the line, on this line, but the recurrent synchronization is here and here. Or by this bifurcation diagram, beta was, was this uh, phase shift parameter, which you see also kind of induces asymmetry between uh, these adaptation rules. So and if, if it is non-zero, uh, or not, I guess here should be pi, uh, then we have recurrent synchronization. Here it's kind of uh, a number, of the probability to get the recurrent synchronization. But if beta is zero, we have kind of symmetric adaptation rules and we don't have recurrent synchronization. Uh, intuitively, uh, this 
asymmetry in, in kind of adaptation from A to B, from B to A, uh, makes a kind of rotational dynamics in the phase plane also of our two-dimensional system. But it's kind of very intuitive. Okay, so uh, I would like to very shortly show you numerical examples for Hodgkin-Huxley model. Uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model, uh, this is uh, this uh, large system of ODE with uh, synaptic coupling here with S variable describing the dynamics of synapses as uh, Andre showed in his talk. And STDP is uh, event-driven adaptation, so it's discontinuous, which we found uh, just artificial, in this case, uh, adaptation rules, which are asymmetric. And in that complicated system with discontinuous adaptation, one has also, uh, one can find uh, this kind of desynchronized and synchronized regimes here. Here on this plot, we show uh, mean frequencies of one population and another population. And here they are synchronized, here they are desynchronized. And we have this recurrently. Uh, this picture shows uh, just two coupled Hodgkin-Huxley systems for which we can do averaging numerically. So this was interesting to see that for this relatively complicated system with discontinuous update rule, one can still reduce the whole stuff to this two-dimensional phase uh, uh, plane, two-dimensional ODE, where we can identify asynchronous, synchronous, and stable limit cycle, which you show here. That's, I don't go into details, just to... Why is it surprise? Uh, you don't need spikes here, right? Just I don't know. Uh, for me, it was a surprise that we can you get... You have a small system that drives the fast one, let's say. Uh, the main idea works, yes, yes. Uh, no, it, 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 we have been surprised that it shows so nicely, yes? So that we have a nice limit cycle and it can be really uh, averaged, yeah? We have discontinuous updates here. Okay. But of course, if you understand that the main ingredients are not model dependent, then it's not a surprise, right? Yeah, you have a just slow subsystem that drives the first one, right? Basically, it's connected. Yes, yes, yeah. So as, as far as you understand in terms of like minimal model, then one can extend and then no surprise, right? Okay, so this is just a kind of summary that we found the phenomenon in which each individual nodes, by the way, they, they are still all are spiking. But what we observe is that collective dynamics changes. Yeah, first it's synchronous and then desynchronous, and that was due to the interplay huh, of adaptation and uh, dynamics. Okay, so this was uh, recurrent synchronization. Now I have uh, 20 minutes, right? I guess. Oh, it's 10, yeah. Yes, 10, yes. Ah, oh, that's okay. Um, to show you a second example, I think this is also quite representative for the dynamics of adaptive networks. Uh, so I, I'll show you first numerical observation. What does it mean? And then I start just from one cluster state and uh, explain you what are multi-cluster states. And uh, I guess I will not go into all technical details due to the time restriction. So let me uh, first uh, show you a minimal model. I will illustrate also with Hodgkin-Huxley, with more details model. But just to understand the main idea, phase oscillators are also nice. So uh, here are all the same model, adaptive phase oscillators. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, this is this parameter beta of the adaptation function can uh, emulate, uh, can uh, correspond to different learning rules. Like if beta is minus pi half, then this function reflects a uh, Hebbian-like learning rule. If beta is zero, then we have kind of STDP uh, adaptation rule. So that's, that's interesting that simple model can uh, model different cases of uh, neural adaptation rules. So let me show now the numeric. So these are just uh, phase oscillators on the ring, and uh, connections are shown by, by the lines with different color intensity, uh, showing the kappa ij, uh, the coupling weights. We're just uh, numerically solving it, and this is basically what you see very often when you model this system. 
So you see that uh, there is a, a group with strong connections, another group with strong connection, and a small one with strong connection, and uh, between the groups we have, uh, we have weak connection. And this is very robust with random initial conditions. You get different groups. There is a high multi-stability. Uh, but practically, we have just different clusters, you see. In this case, three clusters appearing dynamically. This is uh, just numerical simulation of 200 uh, hodgkin huxley neurons with STDP. And we see we start with random initial condition. This is a Jensen symmetrics. And with time, we see also, in this case, also three emerging clusters, which are strongly coupled. Uh, let me uh, explain now what these clusters are. May maybe a uh, first remark, a very important remark, that which you don't see here. Each cluster is strongly connected, and it has its own frequency. So at the end, this cluster has one frequency, this is another, and this is another. So this, that's why we call it multi-frequency clusters. So we have coexisting uh, frequencies, different uh, frequencies in the system. So what are the one cluster state? So building blocks, yeah? just one cluster state in our case. If we have this phase oscillator model, then it's just uh, this uh, very simple rotating wave or uh, this solution, yeah, with constant kappa ij, phi i, which are given by this frequency, we can very simply find the solution from this equation. We could substitute it here. This is a simple uh, case of identical frequencies, just to, to have it have everything analytically very simple. If we substitute it, we get this equation for ai. Yeah? So basically what we want to find is ai and omega. These are uh, unknowns. Kappa ij will be given by some expression which depends on ai and omega. So this is an equation. And you see that the second order parameter plays a role here. Uh, and in particular, from this equation already, you can see that is, if the second order parameter is 0, then we just have a very nice equation for omega and everything kind of, we have a solution. Yeah? And these states we call splay states. There are also other cases when the second order parameter equals to 1. We can also uh, solve this in this case, and these are called antipodal and double antipodal. So you see that this one cluster building blocks can have different structure, and I just want to illustrate this one cluster states. So this is, uh, this are display state clusters, which have this uh, shape with a second order parameter equal to zero, with this frequency. And this is an example of this first play cluster. So they can be just uh, uniformly distributed along the phase, or like this, or like this. This is how it looks uh, if we look at the adjacency matrix in this case. If we have a coupling matrix, then it can look in of uh, like this for display states. They are strongly connected by the coupling weights, but the coupling weights are not homogeneous. They kind of vary with, uh, with space. Yeah, we are fixed with time, but they are changing in space. And this is how display state can, can look like. These are phases and uh, index of different uh, neurons, phase oscillators. OK, so let me then uh, go into skip some, uh, some slides, and just a summary of this building blocks of single cluster. They can be of splay state, uh, K, uh, splay um, uh, form, yeah, so that we have this coupling matrix. They can be antipodal, that they are just two blocks with uh, very strong uh, coupling weights of different uh, sign, and also that this case is possible. So the different cl classes of clusters, including the, uh, the complete synchronization. So this antipodal would include complete synchronization if there is no blue. Yeah? So that's one cluster states. And now multi-clusters are just combinations of this uh, one cluster state. So we can have, for instance, a combination of this uh, uh, splay clusters, 
one cluster, another one, and there is weak connection. We could have this antipodal with weak connection between them, but we can have also mixture. We have one cluster of this kind, another cluster of this kind. I will not go now into details. I skip all technical uh, stuff. So here, probably here, uh, if you look at the time raster plot time, uh, phases later and you look at the dynamics, you see these clusters like uh, of this different shape. And it's important that they all cluster have different frequencies in this model. Um, skip again, there is a huge multi-stability. So if you start with the slightly changed initial condition, the, there is a high probability you're going to into another cluster. So this is just multi-stability for two clusters. There's a lot of them. But this is just two cluster, and you have we can have many, many free clusters and four cluster. Okay. I just have to finish probably. It's a little bit late, so still no, it's okay. I, I just want to still describe yeah. this and then I finish, yes. So I want just to, to have to, to describe the main idea why uh, these multi clusters appear. Uh, because the, the main idea also tells you that it is model independence. It's not about phase oscillators or something like this. So if we have like coupling adaptation of this four, yeah? uh, like pairwise interaction, uh, uh, this is a coupling between uh, oscillator I and oscillator J. And these are the phases of oscillator I and oscillator J. So if the phases of oscillator one has, uh, rotates with frequency omega one, and the phase of oscillator J rotates with the frequency omega two, yeah, then we substitute here in this form, and then we have this for, for the interaction function just sine of delta omega times D. So we have that the right hand side, the, so the dynamics of the interaction coupling rotates, uh, is periodic with the frequency which correspond to the difference of the frequencies of two clusters. Yeah? And in, in that model, or let's say in the big class of models, the frequencies are proportional to the size of the cluster. Uh, so we have that uh, frequencies, uh, this delta omega will be proportional to the difference of the size. So if this difference is sufficiently large so that this number is of order one, then we have oscillation, which is of, on this time scale of order one. But this is a slow variable, yeah? So this is a system which is perfectly well for averaging. So we can average the right-hand side. And if we average the right-hand side, so in this case at least, yeah, this terms disappears. The oscillating term disappears. You have just a constant for for kappa. In this case, in this model, the average value is zero. So that means that the interaction between the two clusters just disappears because uh, their frequencies are too different. Or in other words, because the clusters are sufficiently of, of sufficiently different size, they have sufficiently different frequencies, and their interaction is averaged out. So that's kind of the idea which can be applied to kind of larger class of systems. Okay, and then we see the appearance of uh, multi-cluster states with time, how it changes, and you, you can track it. So then finally I show you the numerics for Hodgkin-Huxley. I just repeat that this, the same phenomenon we see also for Hodgkin-Huxley system, the appearance of clusters, and they are also of different size. Yeah, we know uh, why now. Okay, that's uh, all. Uh, just a summary of the cluster part. Uh, what we see is that these multi-clusters are very common in, in adaptive networks. So they possess high multi-stability and they emerge dynamically. So that you start with random homogeneous state and your uh, let's say neural system with adaptation develops very natural different parts which uh, like behave on the different frequencies. Um, and they are kind of interact uh, between, between each other. And then as a final concluding message is that uh, the adaptive networks are extremely important as you see from, from applications. They are very challenging, they are very high dimensional and uh, their dynamics is very rich. So we just only start to 
kind of understanding them and uh, also in, from the point of view, of, from the general point of view. And what I showed you are just uh, two examples of, of the stretch dynamics. So thank you very much.